You see, you have to make sure that all of those bottles are properly arranged, otherwise you just seem like an alcoholic. This way, I seem sophisticated. Hello everyone, it's that time once again where we critique a game that I really enjoyed, that you really enjoyed, and we try to find problems with it over the course of a video that is excessively long and probably overly complicated. But nonetheless, we're gonna do it and we're gonna have fun while doing it. Now, the first thing I wanna stress about Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is that I'm a big From Software fan. I was a huge fan of Bloodborne. I even speed ran it for a little while. I wasn't ever very good. I was able to beat it in about three hours, but nonetheless, I still really enjoy these games and I'd like to think that I'm semi-decent at them. And so going into Sekiro, I, I was really interested because this game is unlike almost any game that From Software has tackled in the last five, six, seven years. It's much more of a rhythm game than it is an action RPG. Sure, there's sort of skill trees and things that you can tackle, which we're going to address in more detail in a little bit, but it is very, very different. And for some people, they love it way more than any of those other games. For others, they absolutely hate it. I find myself somewhere in the middle where it doesn't feel like any of the others, but there are still shadows of those previous titles that you see cast all throughout this game. And we're gonna cover those and we're gonna tackle why some of these changes are good, why some of these changes are bad. We're gonna look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. We're gonna break down what I think of this game and I wanna hear all of your thoughts down below as well. And I think it goes without saying, but nonetheless, I will say it regardless. And that is, of course, spoiler warning is officially issued. We're gonna talk about almost every single boss in the game. We're gonna talk about almost every single area in the game, how the game works. We're gonna break it all down. So if you haven't played the game yet and you intend to, pause the video. It'll be here when you're done. Go play it and come back. But with all that said, let's jump into it. As with most From Software games, there's a fairly large learning curve associated with them. What I mean by that is that if you are accustomed to these types of games, you play Dark Souls, you play Bloodborne, you play Demon Souls, you're going to actually probably have a longer period of time in getting used to the design shifts that they've made than somebody that's coming in blind. And that's primarily because each of those aforementioned games have specific ways that they want to condition the player into playing. With Bloodborne, it's all about aggression. With Dark Souls, it's much sturdier and more resilient and allows you to have a lot of different play styles that again are all at your disposal. And for me, one of the first things I realized about Sekiro was that this game is much less sturdy than a Dark Souls and even a Bloodborne, which I wouldn't consider sturdy to begin with. Now, what do I mean by that? When I say sturdy, I mean it accounts and is built around multiple play styles, multiple abilities, different ways of tackling the challenges. And as far as my estimation goes, it seems as though Sekiro accounts for basically two play styles, the hyper-aggressive play style and the shinobi kind of sneaky and more tactical play style. Now, while there are absolutely different sort of tactics and skills that you can acquire throughout the skill tree as you go throughout the game, in general, most of these abilities are going to fit into the two broad categories. When compared with Dark Souls 3, Dark Souls 3 accounted for many different play styles. If you wanted to play a slow, bulky tank build, you could do that. If you wanted to build a magic character who can one-shot most bosses, you can do that as well. Just check out speed runs of the game. Within Bloodborne, Everything is about hyper aggression, but underneath that purview, you have a lot of different overall builds that you can tackle, whether that's a slow high damage build or a fast low damage build, or even some of these more nuanced characters that you can get specifically once again, when you look at speed runs that are so finely tuned that they do outrageous amounts of damage. And this is where I think it's important to understand what a game is trying to do, because if we analyze Sekiro against Dark Souls or against Bloodborne, of course, we're gonna to come to different conclusions as to whether or not the game is successful, as to whether or not the game is good, because against those standards, the game is very different and doesn't achieve the same things as you would expect, because Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is not trying to achieve the same things. Many people would say it's more of a spiritual successor to the Tenchu series than it is to Dark Souls or to Bloodborne. And so understanding what the developers were trying to do is a key part of analyzing whether or not it's successful and whether or not it's good, quote unquote, compared to the others. The fact that they took Took RPG elements out of the game when they had it previously in Dark Souls 3, Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 1, Demon Souls, and Bloodborne, of course, is not an accident. They did that very, very intentionally. Some people say it's because they wanted to allow it to reach a broader audience, seem simpler to new players. Some people said that they just wanted to make one experience and cater
cater that experience very specifically for players and not have to worry about taking into account all these other different things. Whatever the reason may be, I don't think is actually important. What's important is that it's gone. And now as we evaluate Sekiro, we can look at it objectively as its own standalone title, not held against Dark Souls and Bloodborne. But at the same time, I don't think it's completely fair to ignore those games when we're evaluating the game. Some reviewers, some critics, and some journalists have tried to look at Sekiro Shadows Die twice as a standalone title, almost as if it came from a completely separate developer, almost like a Neo came, coming out of nowhere, and it's completely different. And I don't think that that's fair, and I don't think you should do that, which is why I'm not going to. What Instead, I think is more fair is to look at it as a new creative direction for this broader series, even though I see this as a separate game outside of that family of games that we've come to know so well. And as we go throughout the rest of the game, I think you'll see, especially when we look at some of the bosses that we're going to be discussing, there's a lot of shadows, as I said earlier, that are cast upon the game that let you see remnants of Bloodborne's design philosophy and Dark Souls design philosophy sprinkled throughout. However, it still stands as a completely unique experience. I guess the take home point is simply to stress that if you're expecting a Dark Souls 4 or a Bloodborne 2 style game out of Sekiro, you're going to be sorely disappointed because that is not what it is and that's certainly not what they were trying to create. Now all of the standard from software design elements are still here. There's still remarkably vague storytelling. There's tons of items that are not really useful as far as I can tell, except for in very uniquely specific built characters that are uh, designed to take advantage of certain weaknesses of very unique bosses, which we'll discuss in just a few moments. There's a healing gourd, which you find pieces of all throughout the world, or seeds of rather, that slowly refill its capacity to the point where by the end of the game, you can have as many as 10 refills that will fill up a huge health bar for you, very similar to the way that the Estus flask works in Dark Souls. And of course, there's idols, which are very similar to campfires or to the lamps that you can find in Bloodborne that allow you to rest and recuperate all of your healing charges and then also fully recover your health as well. But other than that, there's a lot that has changed. For instance, the character is much more stealth focused now, as you see in the gameplay behind me. He has one weapon. You're not shifting weapons throughout the game as you did in Bloodborne or Dark Souls. And beyond that, there's also now a prosthetic, which allows you certain specific abilities in addition to being able to grapple hook around the map, allowing for a whole new level of verticality to the levels that they're building. All of these feel new, refreshing, and especially when you take the time to really delve into the intricacies of each, allow you to have a whole new outlook on the game. Because once again, as I said earlier, if you're coming to Sekiro as a Dark Souls or a Bloodborne player, you're going to come in playing it as though you're playing the second Bloodborne or the fourth Dark Souls. And you need to not do that because the game is fundamentally different. If you approach it as a shinobi, as this sort of stealth assassin who fights dirty, you're going to have a much different experience than somebody who's trying to play it clean or who's trying to use all of these items in conjunction with each other and play it the way that you've played the other games. You really do have to look at it fresh from a different perspective. And when you do that, you'll reach what I would call the click moment. We'll come back to the click moment in just a second, but first I want to stress that the combat has been completely revamped and revitalized around one singular idea. This idea is something that Hidetaka Miyazaki has actually talked about extensively, and that is that with Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, he didn't want it to feel as though it was a hunter going up against a beast or uh, a singular knight going up against all of these monsters and terrifying creatures that have become too powerful for their own good. Instead, he wanted to recreate the feeling of two swords clashing against each other. And to be perfectly honest, he completely succeeded in this. And the way he did this was with a parry system, which you can see going on behind me in the final boss fight of the game. By the time you've reached this point, you hopefully have a pretty good understanding of how the clashing system works, how the parry system works, how you have to time it just right so that you deflect the attack with a perfect deflect, building up the posture meter of your opponent, which allows you to eventually get a death blow to take out one of their health bars. In the same way that the parry system within Bloodborne can nerf a lot of bosses, understanding the parry system can nerf a lot of bosses as well. But I use the term nerf very loosely because the idea of nerfing a boss implies that you are somehow uh, 
creating an unintended consequence of their AI or the way that they're balanced and you're abusing that system. That's not what's happening here. Instead, I'd like to think, and from my analysis of the game, it seems fairly robust, in that when you're nerfing quote unquote a boss by parrying the crap out of them to the point where you can perform a death blow, it isn't unfair. That's exactly what the game wanted you to do and you're playing the way that the game designers intended you to play as a shinobi, as somebody who's a master of their craft and of their art form. Perfect example being Ishin the Sword Saint, which is the final, final phase of the final boss at the end of the game, who is in and of himself, of course, as you would expect from the name, a sword saint. He is a master of it, uses a lot of the abilities that you acquire throughout the game in order to fight you. And it's a fantastic flip on the head because you actually see sort of a, a mirror reflection of you, somebody who fights the way that you've been fighting, using a lot of the same abilities, dodging and, and deflecting your attacks, it's absolutely fascinating, which is why this is my favorite boss fight in the entire game. But how does this relate to the click moment that I referenced earlier? Well, when you understand what the game is expecting of you, when you understand how the parry system, how the deflect system, all of these things work, you will start to have a very easy time, especially with the humanoid enemies that you'll encounter throughout the game. For instance, with General uh, Genikuro Ashina, I actually beat this guy on my second try because it clicked for me what I was supposed to do on one of the mini bosses right below the castle where you fight this individual. And so by the time I got to the general, I was having a very easy time. And like I said, I beat him on my second try. So when this combat system clicks with the player, at least for me, it very much clicks to the point where the difficulty goes from pretty high drops significantly which is thankfully why they throw in some curveballs to try to shake this up which we'll get to in just a second now long arm centipede giraffe is another boss or mini boss that you can fight who is incredibly frantic and if you don't understand the parry and deflect system is going to be terrifying and no doubt kill you dozens of times however once you understand the deflecting system it becomes remarkably easy and this is actually one of the most interesting bosses in the game to me because it's a beast-like boss but can be deflected and approached in the same exact way that you approached the general just a little while before this depending on how you are approaching the game and going through its levels and this is something that from software actually does a lot in their games where they'll introduce a concept to you and then they'll start to poke and prod at you to make sure you understand it and then they'll throw you a curveball to see if you can still apply that same concept to a new and crazy different boss fight and challenge that's assigned to you. So after you fight the centipede, you'll find yourself going up against Corrupted Monk, and depending on the route that you go, you'll also end up fighting Guardian Ape, which is the biggest curveball that they throw at you, at least in my opinion, in the entire game. Now we'll come back to Guardian Ape and Corrupted Monk in just a few minutes, but first I wanna stress that because of these big shifts in terms of the parry system, I started to feel as I went through the game and got further and further in, that the game was much more tedious than comparative previous titles that from software has developed. The game feels much more like Guitar Hero than it does some broad action RPG exploratory game, which is what I went into the game, I think falsely, expecting out of it. The reason I say it feels more tedious is because when you understand, when this click moment happens, when you understand what the game wants from you, you know what you need to do. All it is at that point is a matter of properly timing your deflections, dodging around the unparryable attacks, and repeating that process. And a lot of that is just about repetition and understanding and learning the different attacks and patterns that each boss has, which is where the difficulty comes in later in the game because the bosses acquire more movesets, more erratic attack patterns, and even some of the attacks start to mimic each other and have similar tells that start the movement. Now look at, for instance, Armored Warrior. Armored Warrior is a fairly straightforward boss. He has no health bar effectively because he's covered in armor. It never dilutes or chips down. So instead, you just have to build up his posture meter to the point where you can form a death blow. Really simple, and he's got pretty clear attacks that are sharp, clear, and consistent. So all you have to do is learn those patterns, rinse and repeat the process, and you'll beat him in no time. Which is why on my second run through the game, I beat him on my first try within 
30, 40 seconds. But my first time around, I had a real hard time with him just because I was trying to learn all of the movesets, all of the patterns, which is what you do in these games. But it didn't feel challenging in the same way that I expected it to. It just felt tedious because I, ha I hadn't learned or absorbed what was going on and it didn't reward reflexivity as much as it did understanding the patterns and the tells before they happened. It's for this reason that I think Sekiro is both easier and more difficult at the same time than Dark Souls and Bloodborne. Because in Bloodborne, I remember going through the game and beating bosses on my first try on my first run through just because I had understood what was expected of me. Hyper aggressive gameplay could work no matter what you did or what situation you were in. So I just got in there and smacked that booty and everything was great. But with Sekiro, it doesn't work the same way as you can tell. Now, of course, all of this is an anecdote and is based off of my experience with the game, but at the end of the day, that's all I really have to go off of. Many players, I'm sure, were able to get through a lot of bosses like Armored Warrior on their first try because they just got it, it clicked, and they were able to tell when each attack was coming, deflect everything, and it was easy peasy. And that's kind of the nature of these games, right? Is that for some people, they'll have one boss which is remarkably easy, and for other people, it's just unbelievably hard, and they spend hours and hours and hours working on them. But I think for me, the frustrating thing with Sekiro is that it didn't feel challenging. It just felt tedious for a lot of the bosses. Some of them were different and we'll get to those. But in general, it felt much more like I was just going through the motions to learn each of the moves so that I could properly parry and deflect each attack rather than using instinct in the moment to fight and defeat this boss. I felt like I had to do my time first effectively before I could even stand a chance against some of these bosses. An Armored Warrior is is a strange example, of course, because he's one of the earlier mini bosses that you can you encounter in the game. And he's also relatively easy and simple compared to the rest. But for me, it was a, a real check against my skill and my understanding of what the game wanted from me, which is why you can't pass this area. You can't move on in the game until you take this guy out. He is mandatory. All of this to say, I think the game succeeds in what it's trying to achieve, which is highly skilled sword fighting combat where it honestly feels like you are a shinobi master, that you know what you're doing and you are an expert in this art form. And beyond that, it also encourages the player to play aggressively while still understanding that there's a real rhythm to battle that you need to understand and that it can often turn much more into a dance than it turns into a hectic, chaotic fight. I think it's a matter of taste. For some people, they're going to love the hectic, chaotic battles that you encountered in a Bloodborne, as I did. And then for other people, they're going to love the much more systematic, rhythmic fights and battles that you'll encounter in Sekiro. They're different. And I, I can understand why some people would like one over the other. Now, most of the design choices that From Software actually made within the game encourage this gameplay loop. And one of the things that I was initially very hesitant towards while I was writing the script and, and outlining what I wanted to discuss in this video had to do with spirit emblems because spirit emblems are limited in my case because I leveled up a, a particular skill fairly early on I had about 17 spirit emblems throughout the majority of the game and these are finite so you need to either discover them or purchase them at idols as you go through the game and as you go through the game the cost of each of those spirit emblems at each of the idols increases as well eventually getting to the point where they're 50 of the currency you collect throughout the game each, which is pretty excessive even later in the game. Now, initially I was confused as to why they had these limited in the game, why they didn't just let them refresh every time you died. Because again, it's a very conscious decision to make something finite, something that you think would just regenerate every time you die, but to make it finite. And in this case, after thinking about it for a while, I thought that we could compare them directly to blood vials within Bloodborne. Now in Bloodborne, blood vials, just like spirit emblems in Sekiro, are a finite resource. So usually you need to just go through, farm them, and discover them as you explore the world. And again, this is a very conscious decision because in Bloodborne, these are the healing items. So why would they limit healing items? Why wouldn't they just make it regenerate every time that you rested at, in this case, a lamp or that you died and were able to regenerate? Why didn't they do that? In this case, they chose not to do that specifically because they knew that by making these items finite, you would be less likely to use them. And why would they want you to be less likely to use healing items? Because it pairs perfectly with, in this case, the rally system that they have within the health bar within Bloodborne itself. 
In Bloodborne, every time that you take damage, your health bar will decrease by whatever amount of damage was dealt to you. However, it won't completely deplete at that exact moment. Instead, you'll have a short period of time that you're able to go and recover some of that health back simply by going and dealing damage yourself. So if you, in, you take damage, you have the chance to recover that damage by inflicting it to another opponent. So what this effectively means is that when you're in a boss fight and you take damage, you could think to yourself, ooh, I could just run in the corner and use a couple blood vials and boost my health back up, or I could get in there, deal some damage and recover it for free because I only have a set number of blood vials and so in the way that they've limited the blood vials and the healing items, it actually encourages the player to play more aggressively than they would have otherwise, simply keeping the blood vials as a constantly renewing resource, just like the Estus Flask and just like in Sekiro, the healing gourd. And this is why when we look at Sekiro and we look at Bloodborne and we look at Dark Souls, when there seems to be a very obvious design choice that was not made or that the opposite choice was made, usually it's not because they're just being stupid or they're trying to make it harder for the player. Usually there's actually a reason that they made that choice. How does this work in Sekiro? Well, spirit emblems are limited and are what you use for all of your prosthetics. So by limiting them, the obvious assumption and inference is that they are trying to discourage the player from using these spirit emblems and from using their prosthetics as much as they want in each and every battle. And initially I thought that was weird because they put in prosthetics into this game when they weren't previously something that From Software had messed with, and then they're limiting them and trying to prevent you from using them. But it actually makes sense when you think about it, because with these bosses, if they're trying to recreate the feeling of swords clashing, why would they try to encourage you to use these gimmicks and these little cheat method ways of getting through the fight? Instead, they'll give you those as a way of making the game technically easier by having these different dirty tactics you can employ, which are still intended by the developer, they're still put in the game, but they'd rather you and they're going to try to push you towards the other way, which is using the, the core gameplay mechanic of the rally and parry system. Now, the obvious question is whether or not this leads to the game being more fun or less fun if the prosthetics make the game more engaging or if limiting them makes the game more engaging. And honestly, I'm not really sure. And usually with these types of things, the reason that they have both options in the game, instead of just stripping the prosthetics outright, I mean, they could have done that. They could have had it just so that you are a sword fighting samurai looking dude and that's all you're doing but they chose very consciously to leave the prosthetics in leave these special abilities in but make sure that they're limited and that you only use them when it's intelligent to because you have this limited resource which once again is why the price raises each and every time you level up throughout the game to the point where they are very expensive to acquire and I will just say, this is one of the reasons I love doing these types of videos and critiques and analyses, because on the outset, when I first was thinking about this, when I was first playing Sekiro, I really didn't like the fact that spirit emblems were so limited because it seemed like they were necessary for me to get through the game. But what I realized on my second playthrough was that you didn't actually need them. Sure, they made things easier, but you can get through all of the boss fights without using them. It's just a matter of getting really, really good at the core system they put in there. Now, I don't think that they're trying to force the player to never use prosthetics, but rather to use them more intelligently and scarcely so that when you are using them, they are at their most effectual. I will say one mechanic that I thought should have been more prevalent or should have been uh, a standard practice within Sekiro was that I was surprised you weren't able to directly use as a prosthetic spirit emblems in order to recover like half your health bar, where you use three to five spirit emblems to recover your full health bar or something like that. Because it seems as though if these are going to be a finite limited resource, perhaps from the very start of the game, you have your healing gourd, but as a last ditch effort, you can use these finite resources in order to recover some health and get a little bit further in the battle if you need to. I don't know, it's a, it's a small detail, but it seems like something that they would have put in. I, I don't know, I'm sure they have a reason they didn't, but it struck me as odd that it's not there. Another thing that I thought they might have included or at least played around with was actually including Bloodborne's rally system that we discussed earlier in Sekiro, where you take damage and playing hyper aggressively could allow you to recover it. But the obvious issue being that with some of the more difficult bosses, you're not actually dealing damage out very often. Instead, you're just parrying each other, trying to build up and break down the posture meter. So allowing this rally system to recover health wouldn't likely work because 
especially by the end of the game, most of these bosses, you might deal one hit every 30 seconds where you actually are dealing damage. Other than that, it's all posture. I suppose you could tweak it so the amount of posture that you build up is the amount of health that you recover. I'm not so sure. It might become just overly complicated and be tough to explain to players, which is why they didn't include it. Either way, I think it could have been interesting. And now we get into the nitty gritty of this video, which is the combat itself. Now, one of the big things I noticed very early on while playing through Sekiro is that it seemed as though the game tolerated, I'll say, a, a spamming of certain techniques. So for instance, jump stuns is one thing you can do that easily spams certain opponents. Uh, and it, it felt as though I was breaking the intended mechanics of the game and I felt as though I was uh, not doing something right. Uh, I was I was cheating. It, it just felt wrong and dirty, especially after I had tried for so long to get past this boss. And then you discover the jump stun and all of a sudden it's completely nerfed as we discussed earlier. It just felt wrong. I don't know how else to put it. But one thing I noticed, especially after finishing the game, was that these types of techniques aren't necessarily unintended all the time. Just because they take somebody who is very, very difficult and then you figure out some little trick to them that makes them incredibly easy, it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. If anything, it means that you were being resourceful and found a certain trick or, or tactic to apply to them that other people didn't. Now, in my estimation, there's basically two approaches we can take to this. On the one hand, we can say that it is not in the spirit of the game to find these exploits and that it's cheating and it's just wrong. And then there's the other side, which is that you're playing as a shinobi, somebody who fights dirty and that you should try to be as resourceful as you can. Going back to our discussion with the prosthetics and with all these special abilities you can uh, apply using spirit emblems, is that wrong that you're using so many of those or are you simply being resourceful and using the tools given unto you to defeat these difficult bosses and overcome these vast challenges? And I don't think it will surprise you to say that I find myself siding with the latter. And one of the easiest things I can point to to defend my position of saying that From Software intends for you to have these little tricks and and exploits uh in order to take down some of these bosses is that they've patched out certain exploits and left in certain exploits so for instance with this particular fella who's just a delight the actual true quote-unquote corrupted monk there was an exploit when the game first launched during the first phase, which allowed you to go and zip from tree to tree to tree, get behind him instantly and get a death blow without having to do anything. And then in the second phase, of course, there's another way that you can do this while he's summoning all of these apparitions where you can actually perform a death blow as well while you're flipping through the trees and he's casting these. During one of the latest patches, they actually took out that first exploit where you can perform a death blow after zipping from tree to tree for the first bar, and they kept in the second exploit. So clearly they meant for you to find the second exploit, they intended that, but they patched out the first exploit, because in their eyes, I suppose that wasn't intended, that wasn't part of the intended process, whereas the second exploit was. But I think the obvious question is whether or not any of this actually matters. I mean, it's easy for us to talk all day long about the intent and the artistic integrity of the piece of art we're evaluating. But what good does it actually do? Like, what, what's this conversation actually about? And to be honest, I completely sympathize with this. I mean, what does it matter if this is intended or if it isn't? If you find an exploit to get past a boss, who cares? After all, like that IGN reviewer, I believe it was IGN, said where he was using a straight up cheat uh, to get past the final boss of the game and he wasn't ashamed about it. He beat the game. He had a good time. Why should we care? And obviously, as I made a video about that, discussing that very topic, it, it's a little bit of a gray area because he was actually altering the game code with a mod on the PC port of the game. But with this conversation, I think it is important. And to discuss it, let's take it out of the realm of video games. Let's look at horror movies. Now I'm a huge fan of horror movies. I love them to death. I've been pondering whether or not we should do a critique like this for a horror movie like A Quiet Place. When I did a video on it, people seemed interested enough. I don't know, let me know your thoughts down below. What I will say is that there, to me, seem to be very clear things that horror directors intend for the viewer to do in order to have the quote unquote optimal experience. So for instance, when you're watching a horror film, I think most people would agree the quote unquote best way to do it 
is to watch it in a dark room, all the lights turned off, to have everybody be quiet, put the phones away, just watch the TV or the screen in front of you and turn up the volume, get completely immersed in the film. And if you have a surround sound system, turn that on. Most people would say that that is the ideal way of absorbing a horror film. But why? Well, I would say obviously when an artist is creating some piece of entertainment for us, in this case a horror film, they are intending for you to absorb it and have a perspective against it in a very particular way. So when they're making the film, they're assuming you'll watch it in the theater. That's their first assumption. And based on that, they tailor the experience for that set premise. And I don't think that's controversial. I think most people would agree that watching a movie on your cell phone while you play Sekiro, so it's just background noise, is not what the artist intended when they created that film. Rather, they intended you to sit down, commit to watching it, and absorb it with your full attention paid unto it. This isn't to say that watching a horror movie with the lights on, or with your phone out, or with somebody next to you that you're occasionally chatting with, or you're roasting the movie, or something like that it's not to say that you're wrong for doing that or that you're not going to enjoy the film but obviously it it's a spectrum the best experience is over here and that's the director's vision and then a terrible experience is over here with people around you chatting and talking texting on their phones with the light shining up that's the worst experience best experience it's on a scale it just depends on what you do in order to land somewhere on this scale. I personally prefer to get as close to the director's vision, as close to the artist's vision of what this should be as possible, whereas other people don't care as much. And when they play a game like Outlast, we'll go and play it with the sound turned off and with all the lights on and not really pay that much attention. It all just depends on what you want to get out of it, which is why I said, if you wanna go and play through Sekiro with cheats, go for it. You're just a little bitch. Don't worry, I'm not gonna let this play. I'll cut it off now. No spoilers. And so if we pull all of this back into the context of Sekiro and video gaming in general, we can say it's okay to play the game in a spammy way or an exploitatious way, but you're just not going to experience it in the same way that the artist originally intended you to, at least not all the time. In the same exact way that a speedrunner is taking advantage of a lot of exploits in the game that the artist probably didn't intend for the average person to take advantage of. They're still playing the game, they're just not playing it in the way that the artist and the directors and the game designers intended them to do it to begin with. It's still awesome, they're still having a great time, it's just different. Which is usually why people would say for the first run through, play it the way that it was intended, second run through, you can do whatever you want. But again, it's also none of our business who gives a crap. I don't, I don't do whatever you want, but I reserve the right to tease you if you're being, once again, a little bitch. Cheers. By the way, this is Sad Panda. I don't know if you guys, it's, it's a local beer to where I live. Like this brewery is within like 10, 15 miles of where I currently am filming this video. It is a, a dark coffee stout and it is delicious it's from the horse and dragon brewing company look them up i recommend it and maybe if you drink it you won't die as frequently in sekiro i don't know and I, no i'm not sponsored by them i'm just trying to get to the point where i am for free beer you know oh crap youtube doesn't like beer do they um it's not beer it's it's just coffee forget that i said stout it's just coffee in a can from a brewery <laughs> Now, another thing I think it's important that we touch base on and, and discuss is the fact that a lot of these bosses are repeated a lot. It's something that we're kind of used to in From Software games, that they will do reskins and they'll repeat arenas and bosses occasionally, but it's pretty frequent in this game. Like, for instance, this guy, Headless, is in the game, at least according to my count, five different times. Occasionally underwater, sometimes still on land or in a cave but five different times in the game. And you know, it'd be one thing if the fights were completely different every time you encountered him, but for the most part, other than underwater and not underwater, they're pretty much the same exact fight. He has effects that slow you down, and then he has terror buildup, which makes the fight kind of miserable unless you have certain items that are either able to dispel it or are able to deal enough damage fast enough that he can't build it up. Furthermore, General Ganikuro is in the game about three times, Headless Ape is in the game twice, Corrupted Monk is in the game twice, and Owl, the, the father Owl, is also in the game 
twice. And, I, you know, it's one thing if you need to reskin an enemy or if a boss later becomes a, a generic NPC that you fight. That's been done before in games like Bloodborne. But this, this is just... This is just silly. Furthermore, a lot of the arenas are also reused a bunch. The top of Ashina Castle, for instance, is used, again, by my count, in roughly four unique different boss fights, depending on which ending you're going for. Or like the dojo is used for two different mini boss fights. Or Lady Butterfly's arena is used twice for her and for Father Owl. So it's, it's again, it's one thing that it's just hard to ignore, but the question is whether or not this is a result of clear concise design choices, or if it was budgetary, or if it was a time restriction, it's kind of hard to say. And to be honest, I don't even really know what I would do with that information if I were granted it. I don't know what we can extrapolate from it, other than the fact that From Software in the past has had a history of putting out games that are pretty incomplete. Dark Souls 3 had a lot of glitches, a lot of hitbox issues. They even had entire untextured areas where they were in the playable area, but the ground simply didn't have stone textures or you could clip through walls that didn't have uh, nav meshes associated with them. They have had a history of rushing out content or just getting to the point where they focused on most of the big bosses, but didn't put a lot of focus in other areas of the game. In general, there aren't a whole lot of glitches or a lot of exploits that you'll find where the game is just flat out broken. It's pretty well polished across the board, but there are a fair number of times when you recognize that they are repeating a fair amount of content. And if that's the price we have to pay for a well-polished game, I'm willing to pay that price. It's perfectly understandable to me if they needed to repeat the dojo twice and the top of Ashina Castle four times in order to put out a game that was polished. I'm willing to make that sacrifice. But everybody mostly just cares about the bosses. So let's talk a little bit about some of the most pivotal bosses in the game in terms of skill checks, in terms of design, everything like that. The first one that obviously comes to mind is General Ganikuro Oshina. And this is because he's the first major skill check in the game. There's, in past games, there's been DPS checks and build checks and everything to make sure that your character is properly leveled for that area. But this is a skill check through and through. It's making sure that before you move on, you have the necessary understanding of the parry, block, and deflect system in order to even stand a chance against the bosses that would come after this guy. And in the same way that I think if you can beat Father Gascoigne and Blood Starved Beast in Bloodborne, you can get through the entirety of that game. You've kind of proved yourself at that point and you have the necessary skill. I think if you can get past General Ganikuro, you will have had that click moment and you will understand the game well enough in order to finish it through. It's not to say that it's going to be easy. It's not to say that the last boss fight is going to take you any less than eight hours, but it is to say that you will be able to complete it if you put your mind to it, I suppose. And this is why, as I said earlier, once I had already had my click moment, this guy was really easy for me and I was able to get past him on my second try. The next guy we need to talk about, of course, is Guardian Ape, who is quite the interesting creature uh this guy i will be completely honest gave me probably the most trouble of any boss in the entirety of the game to the point where i, I did a poll recently and i asked a lot of you if you had considered giving up while playing through sekiro and a good number of you said it was due to guardian ape and i'll be honest i also had my moments where i wanted to quit after running into Guardian Ape, and I think it's mainly because up until this point, you just finished General Ganikuro, and you've felt like you've really uh, connected with this parry and deflect system where you are clashing swords and it feels great, and then you run into this guy who just doesn't play by the same rules at all. I also just realized that the light behind me turned off in the middle of filming. There we go, much better. Now, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why I felt like Guardian Ape was so weird for so many players who were going through Sekiro. And it finally clicked with me and I realized this is basically like a giant Bloodborne boss, but in Sekiro. In a game about swords clashing, it's a giant flailing monster beast that's unpredictable, that doesn't play by these fair, quote unquote, rules of sword play and pacing and rhythm. Not to mention, like I said earlier, this game is very much about the rhythm and the dance of battle. 
This guy doesn't give a crap. In fact, he farts on you in multiple moves. He's able to jump up and throw his own dung at you. One of the few moves that you're really able to easily exploit. They fake you out with this thing where they tell you there's a shinobi execution. You start running away and you feel really good about yourself. And then you see him in just a second start to move again. And it's the worst feeling in the world because you realize, oh crap, that's the first phase. Here we go, let's, let's do it. It's part of the reason why looking back, I really like like this fight, especially after going up against him later in the game with his boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever, uh, in his reskinning fight. But that first time around, it was it was rough. And this is what I find interesting. The game is able to get you so used to certain types of enemies and certain types of fights, like with General Genikuro, where those are very easy for some players. But then you'll encounter a guy like this, and it is unbelievably difficult, whereas for other people, it was probably a walk in the park, just because of the style of that particular boss, their movements, the way they behave. It's a small shift, but it completely changes the way you have to approach them, and it can really change the way that you play. But one of my favorite elements of all of these From Software games is that you will find a boss like this who's incredibly difficult, and you really struggle with them, and then if there is a reskin later on, you'll find that you have a much easier time with them, even though they're doing a lot of the same moves, simply because you put in the time to learn their moves, to learn their, their approaches to things, and you can adapt to any different situation, even if they are reskinned with more abilities or some sort of elemental damage or something like that. It's super satisfying because you can actually tell that you've progressed and that you've grown as a player in this character's body. But while we're on Guardian Ape, let's talk a little bit about terror and all of these elemental effects because terror is something in that move set right there that builds up very quickly and is basically an instant death blow to the player if it's built up enough. Several bosses in the game build up this particular ability and it's one of the few times in the game where I feel as though it's not fair because once again these games are fun insofar and to the extent of them being fair as long as the damage you take is because you messed up and not because the game messed up or was being unfair that's when it's fun the second that they cheat you the second that it feels unfair it just turns into a chore a miserable chore at that and to be perfectly honest the few times where I've really felt as though the game is being unfair is when I'm encountering bosses that have high terror buildup specifically somebody like Headless. I found Headless within like an hour and a half of starting the game, and this is the moment I actually found him. I was really weirded out. I thought I found a secret area. I was super excited. And then I jumped down there, and this guy exhibits a, a, an effect that makes it so you can't move, and these effects that instantly build up terror. And as you can see, it didn't go too well. I instantly resurrected, thought maybe I can get in there and smack that booty, and it just didn't work. And this is one of the few times where I felt like a boss or a mini boss was just, unfairly advantaged over me. And of course, it's fair to say, well, you're supposed to go there later in the game, as I did, and I smacked him around with the proper items, but it didn't feel fun and fair in the combat. It felt as though I needed special abilities. I needed some sort of gimmick in order to take them down. And part of the reason that this is so frustrating is because usually these games are really good about making it so that if you don't want to use any items, the game is balanced as such where you can do that if you're talented enough, if you have enough ability. But with Headless, it never felt as though I just needed to get good. I just needed to practice more. It just felt like, okay, he's got certain abilities and buildups that are I'm incapable of handling right now, so I've got to come back later. I can understand why some people are okay with it, but to me, it crosses over that line where it's no longer fun and just starts to feel unfair. Another boss I wanted to talk about is actually the Sitchman Warrior right here. Uh, different versions of him show up multiple times throughout the game as well, but you can actually acquire an ability, a scroll, that allows you to perform an air death blow. So while he jumps around flying in the air, you perform a death blow, instantly taking away a health bar. and it reflects and reinforces the idea I was talking about earlier where the game actually wants you to find some of these exploits. You didn't have to buy that scroll or learn that ability, but when you do, it makes the game and this particular boss unbelievably easy to the point where I was able to get through them in about two minutes. And lastly, I think we should talk about the Saint of Swords and the final boss fight in the entire game. As I said earlier, this is just such a well-polished, well-balanced, and in my eyes, fair fight that it just it's so unbelievably satisfying when you get through it. It's really hard to describe. And unless you've gotten through it yourself, I don't think you'll ever be able to really understand because it's it takes so many hours of just relentless pursuit, practice, working for the timings. And when you get it, it 
it feels like a million bucks. My only major frustration with it is that it's four, effectively four phases long. And so by the time you get to the second or third or fourth phases, specifically the third and fourth, you're starting to already get exhausted and it can make those hour, two hour, three hour sessions unbelievably exhausting. Honestly, this one fight could probably lengthen in your playtime by a week or two, if not more, just because you get so into it, you're so hyped up, and then your dreams are crushed inevitably, and you have to walk it off because you can't be tense while taking on this fight. You have to be relaxed. Your timing has to be very precise. Otherwise, everything just collapses in around you, and you have to have that cool, calm demeanor. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. But it is absolutely one of my favorite boss fights in any of the From Software games from the last decade or so. It's absolutely fantastic. I encourage you not to use cheats to get through it, even if it takes you a month and a half of nonstop trying. I think it's worth it. it it's that satisfying. But really, that's where we land. We've kind of covered every topic. I think Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is a fantastic game. It's very different from anything From Software has done to date, but I think it works really well. Is is it better than Bloodborne for me? I don't really think so. Do I like it more than Dark Souls? I don't personally feel that way. Those games are much sturdier for me and I tend to like experimenting with multiple play styles. And so for Sekiro, it's really solid for that one experience. That one experience is highly polished. And if you like this experience, it's the game for you and you will love the crap out of it. But for me, it's just not quite there. I still prefer not just the setting and style of a Bloodborne or the vast RPG implications of a Dark Souls, but for me, Sekiro is, is still a fantastic experience, well worth the money, and uh, I'm really glad that I played it. Do I think we'll get a sequel? I actually kind of doubt it. Uh, this doesn't seem like a game they're going to go back to repeatedly. I think it was kind of a one-off shot. I'd like to be surprised, but I'd probably prefer a Bloodborne 2 before that to be perfectly honest. And so that's it for me. Honestly, thank you for watching. It really does mean the world to me. I wanna hear your thoughts on all of this though. Leave those down below. Uh, I'll be perfectly honest guys, uh, this video has been a long time in the making and two run throughs of Sekiro is not easy, I think on anybody. So I'm ready to walk away. I'm ready to be done and to move on to bigger, brighter pastures, but I enjoyed my time with Sekiro and I hope that you enjoyed the video that resulted from it. So yeah, if I had to sum it up, I would say Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is not always very fun. It is incredibly difficult and it's incredibly satisfying. It's basically sex. But that's all for me, guys. Thank you again for watching, honestly and truly. I love you all more than you could possibly know. Leave your thoughts down below. Like the video if you enjoyed it. Hit the join button if you want to see critiques like these a full week before everybody else, or consider joining me on Patreon. I love you all more than you could possibly know, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.